Welcome everybody to the Altered Americas uh, panel here at the National Book Festival. I'm excited to be here with Miss Lucinda Roy and Miss Brooke. How are you guys doing today? We're doing Thanks. well. Thank awesome, you. awesome. So we're going to get into it. Um, just quickly, my name is Derek Young. I'm the moderator. I am uh, owner, co-founder of Mahogany Books here in D.C. along with my partner and wife. Uh, and I get to be a book nerd today with front, front row seats with these ladies right here talking about these incredible books. So I'm going to do a quick bio, then we're going to get into our discussion, okay? Uh, so Miss Lucinda Roy is an award-winning novelist, poet, and memoirist, recognized for her keynotes on race and gender, creative writing, and education. She's a, she is a distinguished professor at Virginia Tech, where she teaches in the MFA program. Her awards include an honorary doctorate from the University of Richmond, a Barnes & Noble Discover Great New Writer selection, and the eighth Mountain Poetry Prize, Fly in the Coop, her eighth book, and the second novel in the Dreambird Chronicle Speculative Trilogy was published in July by Tor McMillan. In the Freedom Race and Fly in the Coop, she depicts what could happen if, a, if after a second civil war, the fissures in American society continue to grow, and she explores what happens when the magical legacy of flying Africans become much more than a dream deferred when she's not writing, teaching or making presentations. Lucinda is working on a series of oil paintings inspired by the Middle Passage. Welcome. Thank you. And here, uh, Ms. Brooke Blanchard, uh, who writes as B.L. Blanchard, is a graduate of the UC Davis Creative Writing Honors Program and was a writing fellow at Boston University School of Law. She's a lawyer and enrolled member of the Sault Ste. Marie, tribe of Chippewa. Yes. <laughs> um, she's originally from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, but has lived in San Diego for a long time. Um, uh, so, so long that she cannot remember uh, cold weather, fist bump. I'm with you on that there. Uh, the Peacekeeper is a debut novel. The Peacekeeper is set in an alternate history in which North America was never colonized, and the independent Ojibwa. Uh, nation surrounds the Great Lakes. Against this backdrop, a broken detective embarks on an emotional and twisting journey towards solving two murders, rediscovering family, and finding himself. Welcome, Brooke. Thank you. Awesome. So, let's do what we came here to do. Um, we had an earlier conversation. We met uh, and had a great dialogue. And one of the first things that kind of came up uh, in our discussion was the similarities uh, these books being uh, this, uh, two sides of the same mirror, talking about uh, the book commonalities and the differences between you guys' work. I want to have you guys uh, get into that conversation here. Do you want to go first, Brooke? Sure. Um, so Lucinda's book and mine are both ways America could be. Hers is set from where it could go from here, and mine is what it could have been had things gone differently about 500 years ago. And what I thought was so interesting about Lucinda's book is that it's so drawn from familiar events. If you watched the January 6th riot, um, you could easily see where her book is going from there. Um, mine imagine is frankly very aspirational. It, um, it imagines a never colonized America. It imagines an independent Ojibwe nation around the Great Lakes. It imagines um, a society with different, what I think had some different values, and it ends up in a very different place from where we are now. And so um, what's interesting is you had one that kind of veers towards the aspirational, what we hope and believe the world could be like, and we have one that's rather dystopian. And that's, I think, an interesting place where writing in the same year and in the same place in America, we kind of diverged into two different visions for it. One that is very optimistic, one that is optimistic, but you have to go through some more negative things mm -hmm. to get there. Yeah, and I think that that's because, um, and you can probably tell by the way I'm British. Could you tell that from what? <laughs> I, I have a slight Arkansan accent, but that's because I lived in Arkansas for a while, so uh, I've got that wonderful twang. Um, and. Uh, in, in many ways, I do think that our books are kind of similar, Derek, that, that Brooke and I are doing 
much the same thing in terms of what we've decided the imagination can do, that history can be anything that we want it to be. And when I, I know my agents here, uh, uh, Jennifer Wells is here, and years ago, I mean, this, this novel, this uh, trilogy has been like 10, 15 years in the making. And when I first conceived of it and realized that I thought there could well be a second civil war, Lots of people were not thinking that way. It didn't really seem as though that was likely. But where I lived in, in kind of rural southwest Virginia, it actually seemed quite possible. And so in my trilogy, in the middle of the country, it's called the disunited states now. And in the middle of the country, it's secessionist and it's, it's controlled by the homestead territories and they have a kind of plantation system and they have decided that the imported labor that they bring over from the cradle, which is actually Africa, has to be reclassified because they know that they need to have kind of a, a, an enslavement process. So they've reclassified those people as botanicals or seeds. And that means they have no rights at all legally. It's, it's quite brilliant and horrible. And so uh, the people in the homestead territories are not free. But inside the homestead territories, there are all these liberty independence, these wonderful city states like Atlanta and all the naughty states, naughty towns, you know who they are. Uh, <laughs> DC, too, is a liberty independent. And in fact, most of the book, as you can tell from the front, takes place in DC, in the capital. And there is a storming of the capital. And all this, this was written a long time before January the 6th. So it's been really quite creepy to see what is happening now and more and more what seemed to be in the distant future is becoming the near future and the kind of racial and cultural conflicts that tear this nation apart are depicted in the trilogy. But I don't think of it as a dystopian trilogy mm. because at the heart of this is the whole notion of flying Africans and what it means after one young girl transforms into something very different. And that starts a whole ball ro rolling where the homestead territories see that she is an existential threat to them. And trying to make sure that they do away with her altogether is what they try to do during the course of these novels. That's awesome. So I mean, what's interesting here is that and this leads into my second question, is that we're talking about something that is both familiar, something that is rooted in something that is very, um, that we understand, but then you're also trying to now create or provide details on what is now different, what it possibly could be. You're now speculating on what these changes are. I guess what my, uh, my question is, how do you, um, when you're writing a story, how do you want to identify those things that should stay familiar? Mm -hmm. But then as you're creating your characters, how do you then create those small minor details that drive their actions? Well, okay, I'll start. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so I wanted to kind of go back in time and say, okay, my we call it a hinge point in alternate history, the point at which the real history and the alternate history diverge from each other. And I'm going back about 500 years in my novel to the present. Now, we pick up, it starts in the year 2020, a very different 2020 than we all experienced, by the way. And I wrote it in 2019. I didn't know how, how much I'd be diverging. Um, <laughs> but what I wanted to go with is, OK, I want to show two real cities in our world one is what we know as the cities of Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, which is where I used to live. There's also a Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, right on the other side of the river. What if that were one city in one nation? Right now it's split between two. And then I thought I wanted to, sh and it's a very small city now. I kept it as a small city in the novel. It was important for me to set it there for a couple reasons. One, it's where I've lived, and there's very little of the Upper Peninsula in fiction, and it's a beautiful, beautiful place everyone should visit. The other reason is it's the ancestral home of the Anishinaabe, which is my, my people, my tribe, my ancestry, and I, so I, it was important to me to show an alternate version of that. And then in what we know as Chicago in this world is the city of Chicago, And I thought, I'm gonna tear down Chicago 
and I'm going to build Chicago. What, but so to me, it was important to have them in those two places where there's a real, you know, large city and a real small city now, uh, just to help us orientate ourselves. But I also wanted to build a whole new city. What was important to me was what does a modern 21st century indigenous industrialized society look like? And yes, it would exist. Um, and so I thought, you know, what values would drive it? And it was important to me to have a city that didn't pave over the land, but rather is built into it and incorporates it as sort of a natural outcropping of it. So um, it's a, it has living skyscrapers, which I actually did not invent. There's a lot of um, architecture that builds it in, but it's sort of a vertical forest. Each, you know, the walls have plants on them. People's balconies extend out and have trees on them. There are, on the, on the rooftops, there's places for migrating birds, watering holes for them. There's places for communal fires in the middle. Things that could, and I, I actually chatted with an architect and said, if I put a large bonfire in a skyscraper, am I going to burn the place down? He said, not if you do it right. So, <laughs> so they do it right. Um, don't ask me how, but it can, apparently can be done. So just kind of taking the familiar of large city on the Great Lakes, a uh, major city, an international city, but what would be different about it? So there's the physical of it, which is it looks very different. Um, the streets are very narrow. There's really no gas-powered cars. It's built for walking. It's built for mass transportation in a way that Chicago isn't at the moment. Chicago has a lot of mass transit. This kicks it up a few notches. Um, but what I thought, in addition to the physical, what was important to me is sort of the... Um, the values of the society. And I thought sustainability, responsibility, and community would be sort of the three pillars on which this city was built. And so I think, how is that expressed? It's respectful of the land. It's made out of sustainable you know, materials, architecture, all of that. So that to me was important to show, you know, it's, it should feel a bit familiar, but also feel very different. And in a way that you see, oh, with a few other, you know, changed decisions and some different values, what we know as Chicago could look very different. Um, but it's a little hard to do that because at no point do any two characters turn to each other and say, oh boy, didn't we dodge a bullet? <laughs> what if, you know, and go from there. It's just, it's a world that overseas colonization never happened. I do think people will, will always fight with their neighbors, but um, the way it happened in our world didn't. So I guess that was a very long-winded answer, but that's uh, That was that's great. That. And, and I think um, my world is actually fairly familiar in lots of ways. So lots of this novel, Flying the Coop, the second novel in the trilogy, takes place in this city, which is why it's so wonderful to be here. And one of the reasons that um, I wrote some of the scenes in the book is because I read at the Smithsonian a few years ago, and I read in the Oprah Winfrey Theater. Those of you who've been to, this, to the National uh, African American Museum of History and Culture, just the most amazing, amazing place. And I realized that I wanted something to happen in that museum. And so in the middle of the book, well, fairly early in the book, there is a kind of storming of the museum uh, by secessionists who are coming in armed and everyone has gone to the museum thinking it's a safe space. They're living in a liberty city and they think that they're safe. And all of a sudden they look out and they see this horde of people coming to, they think, attack them. I won't tell you what actually happens. But in many ways, DC is very familiar and very strange in the book. So for example, the Washington Monument, because of flooding, has been moved. And it's moved, been moved to a place called Founding Fathers Hill. Um, Martin Luther King has been moved to what's called the Dream Revival District because the, one of the kind of mottos of the book is dreams are promises the imagination makes to itself. And I think that's so true, that they're the promises that we make to ourselves. Those are the dreams that we follow. And so again and again, you see that manifested in the, in the city itself of, of DC. And the refugees who have come from the homestead territories flood to DC. So my, so my city is so much full of conflict. It was funny when I was reading your book, because it's, it is beautifully idyllic in many ways. And it really is the kind of place that I know lots of my characters would love 
to live. Unfortunately, because of the way society has, has progressed in, in the vision that I have for this trilogy, that kind of uh, idyllic situation just is not possible, but it's still something that they strive for and they want. Um, and so there's that sense of taking the familiar and making it somewhat unfamiliar, because in many ways the future is the familiar made strange, always. That's just the way the future works. And I think that there's something wonderful about being able to use the imagination to do that. One of the things I always tell my students, my graduate students and undergraduates, is imagination is the greatest antidote we have against despair. And I really do believe that. That for those of us who've been through trauma, I went through the mass shootings at Virginia Tech, and there's all kinds of things that you understand after that. And I lived in Sierra Leone when there was a coup, and, and I grew up very, very poor. And so, and I think we have a lot in common that way. And so there were just things that I understood about struggle. And so there has to be struggle at the center of wonder. So there's that kind of balance between suffering and wonder. And when the two come together, there is a way to get through to the next place. And you get through with a kind of incredibly deep celebration. Uh, and that's, I have to say, one reason why I love this festival so much, because I do think that librarians and bookstore owners, like you, Derek, <laughs> Mahogany Books, if you haven't gone to Mahogany Books, you have to go. Um, they are the courageous custodians of culture. They really are the courageous custodians of culture. And it has become very dangerous to try to make sure that we hear ideas in this country. And we must do it. And that's why I'm so fascinated by what you've written, Brooke, because I feel as though it makes us think about things anew. It makes us see the world anew and say, oh, maybe that was possible. Maybe that could actually happen. And, and I think that it's that imagination that allows us to leap off into something wondrous that is going to ultimately save us. Because it's always ideas that rule the world. It's nothing else. It's always ideas. And so if we can somehow remind people that the idea of who we are is far greater than the fact of who we are, we can be much more aspirational and we can go towards something kind of wondrous, I think. Absolutely. And one thing I do want to add is even though our books are set in worlds that don't presently exist, People are still people. Humans are still humans. You know, the, the world of the peacekeeper is very aspirational. Spoiler, it opens with a murder. And there's another one later on. People still, and there's a system of justice that's very different from what we know and are familiar with, but it fails. We see it fail a couple of times in the book. Um, you know, in Lucinda's book, you know, it's a very different world than what we live in now, but the struggle, the desire for freedom, the, the desire to connect, wanting to be able to trust people, want, you know, live, pursuing a dream and focusing on it, that's so universal. Exactly. And that's what I think makes, is so wonderful about speculative fiction you know, you can set the human experience in whatever world you want, but it's still the human experience. And that's what makes, I think, at least me come back over and over to this genre, and I think others too. I think that's absolutely true. And you have a character in Peacekeeper that's very much like, I think, the character of Man Crider that I have in my trilogy. Um, you're the, the healer character that you've oh, got. Yeah. And I have a, a kind of healing character called Man Crida. She's also known as the Gardener of Tears. And she tends a wood of these hybrid trees. And it's called a lynching wood, but not because lynching takes place there. It's where she remembers the lynched. And so she makes sure that she honors them. It's a kind of memorial wood. But she is also a very brilliant person and very eccentric. And I, I often feel as though those of us who are older women are often called eccentric when we're just kind of, we're just normal. I mean, <laughs> we just say what's on our minds. And, and so that's why people think that we're eccentric. I would be eccentric any, any day. That's fine. Besides which, being British, then you're always a bit eccentric. But Man, Man Friday, who of course is kind of a riff off of, of, of Man Friday, is trying to make sure that the world that she sees is not the world that she has to leave to the young. 
So she really feels that is, it, is that it is her responsibility to pass something on to the young. And I didn't realize till I really began writing this trilogy that in many ways that's at the core of who I am as a teacher and who I am as a, a writer. It is the idea of legacy. What do we hand on to the young? I want, I want black children to feel like they can possess the world, that it belongs to them too. I was mocked for my hair when I was growing up, for example. Uh, I was mocked for my nose. I was mocked for all kinds of things because there were so few biracial children. I was stoned once, just with pebbles. It wasn't that bad. Uh, but uh, that kind of thing happens, happened a lot growing up. And it, you begin to understand what it's like to be an outcast and to come back to what Brooke was talking about when she talked about that kind of psychological realism, the idea that you want to have characters who seem as though they could actually exist. So I've got a character in the trilogy called Afara, and she is an outcast, and she's not allowed to use her name. She lives in the secessionist territories, and she can only go by cloth 33H slash 437, because she was raised on planting 437. She is the most joyous character in the book. And I really do feel as though if we find a way to take joy, find joy in the small, ordinary things, there is a way for us to get through terrible suffering, which is what she does. And I see your characters doing the same kind of thing, uh, especially the main character who has so much to deal with and, uh, and is so torn and sad, and, and yet there is that desire to help and to heal that allows him to keep going and to do some incredibly brave things, I think. Yeah, and Afara was my favorite character in your books. Um, she is so joyful, but she also, she sees everyone. She sees past everyone's shields, past everyone's defenses, and you know that I thought was so powerful because there's nothing that makes you more vulnerable than someone who sees you. And, and to have that come from such a small young girl is very, very powerful. And I have a seven-year-old who sees through everyone, too. And so I, I found that very Always relatable. <laughs> awesome. Fantastic. I do want to remind everyone that uh, if you want to ask a question, please uh, put your hands up and ask for the uh, index cards. We will be taking questions at the end, but they have to be written on the index card. Uh, one of these people on the left and right will help you out with that. Um, so I'm ready to throw my questions away because this has uh, been a great conversation. I'm, I'm really eager. I, I know you guys had some questions for each other. Mm -hmm. um, we've kind of started going down that road there, but I found it very interesting um, when you talk about bringing that personal into your books and how it informs your characters and what you're trying to uh, push um, or inform people of through your stories. Uh, do you want to share your questions um, yeah, with each other? Yeah, I, let me, I'm desperate to ask Brooke about ethnicity and background and how that came into play in The Peacekeeper and what you drew upon. Um, often I think one of the first questions I'm, I'm asked is, what is autobiographical in the book? And, and I, I don't want to be a kind of um, typical questioner, but I must ask you, what is autobiographical <laughs> in the book? <laughs> I didn't realize this was going to be an expose. <laughs> um, well, I'm a member of the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa. I'm Anishinaabe. And I, it was important to me to write about that. But what was very important to me was to write about the Anishinaabe in the Upper Peninsula. Um, it's a part that is left out of a lot of maps. A lot of times you'll see maps without the Great Lakes, which means the Upper Peninsula, which is right in between Lake Superior and Lake Michigan, you just don't see. Um, it's a very magical part of the world to me. Um, I was actually just there last week for the first time since the pandemic and um, went to uh, where my father lives, and he's here today, uh, in Gould City, which is on you know, Lake Michigan. And it's a place where my family has lived as far back as we can count. There's even an Ojibwe burial ground cemetery that's at least 5,000 years old. And so it's always so wonderful to go back there. But it is a place that has changed so much. It's a town now that has maybe 100 people. Um, at one time, it was a collection of multiple cities that had close to 3,000. 
you would never guess that if you went there today. It's very, you know, the things have been taken down or burned down or have been lost to the woods. There's trees everywhere. Um, but that history of things that, you know, disappear and come back, I thought was kind of appropriate. So that was very autobiographical, very important to set part of the book there. Um, I did not meet my that side of the family till I was almost 20. So I really sort of discovered it as an adult um, for a variety of reasons I won't go into. And so um, that discovery and learning more about that side of my history was very important to me. And I wanted to put that in a book sort of you know, this wonderful, wonderful background that I didn't have as, uh, that I had, but I wasn't familiar with as a child until I, I got quite older. I grew up knowing I was Chippewa, but I didn't, didn't really have a full understanding of what that was until I was about 19 years old. Um, my background is in the law. I'm a lawyer by, by trade, so putting a uh, justice system into the book was important to me, but one that is different. It's a system of restorative justice, which is how most indigenous societies, including the Chippewa, handled, and when they are, have their own jurisdiction, continue to handle disputes. So instead of a system where you have the judge sitting up top, you got the plaintiff one side, the defendant the other side. The, if you were to put a spotlight on who's sort of the star of a trial, it's the defendant. And it's focusing on that person, their wrongdoing. And even though we talk about rehabilitation, really we're there to punish people. It, the system that's in the peacekeeper, and again, this is not my invention, this is a system of justice that was used, is used, should continue to be used in my opinion, we, sh we redirect that spotlight from the defendant to the victim. What makes the victim whole? Now you can't unring the bell. And like I say, in the book, this is not a perfect system. It wouldn't be, no system is. But what if we were focusing on what would restore that person to where they were before the crime happened? What would help heal them and make them whole? And this is actually what, how we resolve most civil disputes in the US. Most cases don't go to trial, most go to a system called mediation where everyone gets in a room and we figure out how are we gonna resolve this without going to trial. And so it was very important to me to show that because first off I think you know, a lot of us have been touched by the criminal justice system. Um, in my family, we have had family members who went through the system, and that had a deep impact on me growing up. Uh, it happened to one of my parents. And there's a scene in the book where um, Chibinashi, our, our hero, recalls after his father was um, taken away for killing his mother, he and his sister went to a um, sort of the equivalent of child protective services for a brief period. Just replaced Chibinashi's name with mine, that's what I went through. Um, except I was quite a bit younger than him. He's 17 when it happens, I was six. And so ha there's still trauma in an you know, I idyllic, aspirational world, but it's not perfect. And showing the impact of the criminal justice system on people, I always kind of say, well, there's, there's another group of people. There's obviously the victim of a crime, there's the perpetrator, there's the lawyers, there's the... Um, police officers, no one thinks about the family of the person who's going through the system. And we're rather an afterthought, and I'm certainly not trying to center my experience, but there is another group of people who are sort of victims of that system too. And it was important for me to show through the eyes of someone who is not themselves the perpetrator, but rather is the family member of someone who is, the ostracization that they feel, the guilt that they feel, you know, all of that that goes into it, and they carry that weight with them too. So that's, and I could go on and on about, you know, like I put a reference to my, one of my favorite restaurants is in the book, my family all caught it, but those are I think the big um, autobiographical parts of it. Um, and I have my question for you, but Lucinda, I'm gonna throw this one back at you, and please do tell what is autobiographical <laughs> in Flying the Coop? And I want to make sure we've got uh, time for Q&A, so I'll, I'll make this, this brief. There's, there's a lot that's autobiographical in Flying the Coop. The main thing is the, the main character, Jellybean Gigi Lotte Mule, and she's called Lotte Mule because she's classified as a mule seed, a mulatto seed. Uh, and by the way, that term mulatto is so awful. 
um, especially when you understand something about the root of the word and so on. Uh, and so she is a mule seed, and she, has, she goes through the same thing that I went through growing up in many ways. Uh, what does it mean? What is your identity then? And she is embraced by black culture, uh, but shunned by most white culture, unfortunately, uh, because of uh, the fact that she is uh, living on a planting, living on a plantation. Um, one of the other just small things that I uh, wanted to make sure I did in the book, I've taught a lot of college athletes. And there is a terrible kind of exploitation and ownership that goes on with black athletes. And I wanted to make sure that in the book there was a game that those botanicals, in quotations, played a game that would assert their, uh, their abilities and say something about their yearning for freedom. So they play this game in a football-sized arena, and inside the arena is a massive birdcage. And inside the birdcage is all kinds of equipment from Obama's drama trampolines to trapezes to Rosa Parks perches. And the seeds, the botanicals, fly inside what's called the coop, the cage. And they battle each other like gladiators. And in many ways, I had to try to think of what kind of game could I invent that, would, uh, that people would risk everything for and would be determined to try to win, but would also say so much about yearning and so much about freedom that again and again is in the book. And now we should take some questions. Though. So we still have a little more time before we get there. But so I do want to ask, um, and so again, remember guys, if you have any questions, please uh, ask for an index card. We will be going to questions in like the next uh, 10 minutes. Um, so one of the things I, I, I did want to ask you guys, and it came up in our conversation earlier, was, uh, again, the world building aspect of it. Um, so from the personal, thinking about the, the new justice systems, um, we, you talk, guys talked about maps and like the importance of maps and even designing and drawing your own maps and things like that. So I wanted to have you guys talk about that. Yeah, well, and in many ways, I think um, maps are, are just so important when you're building a world. And even though my world is familiar, uh, I'm an artist and I, we're, I, I'm actually working on illustrating a children's book. And uh, I used to do portrait painting, but I did it too accurately and people didn't like it very much. So I, did, I was never very successful. But for, the, for this trilogy, I wanted to do the maps. And, uh, and so I tried to do the map as the main character, Gigi Jellybean Lottemule. So I tried to imagine how she would see the world. And you'll see that the first map in the book is her picture of a planting, a plantation. It is illegal to image a planting. You are not allowed to draw a map of a planting. She does it knowing that she risks her life doing it. But she does it because she suddenly understands as she's drawing that she has confined this terrible oppression to a little page. And the fact that she has been able to do that, that she has made it so small, allows her to believe that at some point she will be able to enter the freedom race, and there is a literal freedom race in book one that you can race, and if you get to the end, it is possible you can secure your liberation in the Liberty City of DC, which is known to Seeds as Dream City. And every time I come here, I think, dream city. And I go straight to Martin Luther King's statue. And in the book, Afara uh, looks at the statue when she gets here and fly in the coop. And she can't believe that Reverend Martin Luther King is white. She's so surprised. Like, she had no idea. So she decides he's an albino. And she, he, she thinks that that's wonderful because her best friends in the whole world are albinos back in the, on the plantation. And so there's so, so many things that she understands and that she sees in a world that is, is completely new. But drawing those maps was the most incredible thing to be able to do because Suddenly I saw them and I realized that the planting was going to be a kind of wagon wheel and everything was going to go towards the hub. And in the hub was the penal tree. And that was the place where you could be lynched if you, you made some transgression like imaging 
the planting or some other thing that was not allowed for you to do. Because in order, think about apartheid, how carefully they had to craft that. And in many ways, it's the same kind of care that oppression takes. We have to be so careful about that, especially today, especially today. It seems to me there's no more important time to be talking about these ideas that are in books because very soon, if we're not careful, we will not be able to speak. And having experienced a coup in Sierra Leone that took place overnight, things can change very, very rapidly, especially if people become complacent. So we must always look to see what's coming down the corridor, what's coming down the track to, towards us, and make sure that we're as prepared as we can possibly be, because it seems to me, and this is something that, that Gigi understands, we are the freedom race. We are the freedom race, all of us. We are the freedom race. We're the people who are still allowed to speak truth to power. We are allowed to do it. That's what DC is all about, speaking truth to power. And if we ever forget that, then we're in all kinds of trouble. Absolutely. And um, I think what you said about, to take it back to maps, um, I think what you said is very powerful, how you're telling a story on one page. And in real maps and maps we designed for books, I did not draw my own. I am not an artist like Lucinda. Um, but in a map, you can see a history of people. In mine, that's the 500 years of backstory right there. It's a map of North America, but it's turned, so that's oriented toward the east, not toward the north. That's traditional in Anishinaabe tradition. But what is, I think, also interesting is I learned that is how most maps were oriented until about the 14th, 15th centuries. It's, maps do not have to be oriented toward the north. That is by custom. It is not by anything else. You can orient them south, east, however you want. And when you do, your perspective literally changes. But what's interesting, so you're seeing an, a, a familiar world in an unfamiliar way just through a change in perspective. So what's that telling you before you've even read a word on, of the novel? You realize this is going to be America through a different lens. And then you're going to see in there, there's a little inlet for, inset, I'm sorry, for the Great Lakes. A lot of cities with Ojibwe names in places where we have cities today, I did not invent those. They were there first. Um, same with, you look at the entire United States, you see a, a Central America and you see a bit of North America. These were all real cities, pre-Columbian cities. Um, and you know, this shows you about the history, about where things were, where they are now. Um, there are no borders in this world. Borders are a construct. There's even a, a part of the book where someone is watching a documentary on TV, and yes, there is TV. I do believe we, as a spe we would have gotten that no matter how history went. It's too great of an invention not to have. And he's watching TV and he's looking at the, you know, Europe and he's looking at how they have borders and he's like, you can't draw a circle around the land. What are you talking about? And changes the channel. Like, that's just absurd. You can't own that. What? Um, so that, you know, just having these differences, the map shows the people, the people, the nations who live there. Um, one of my majors, I was a creative writing major, but I also did international relations. We learned about nation states. The nation is the people, and that comes first. And so this is a map of peoples, not of artificial borders or things like that. So that's, I think, you know, I, I can stare at maps all day, and I think, obviously, um, but that's something to think about the next time you look at a map, what's on there, what's not on there, and what story is it telling? Because there's a story in every map, fictional or non-fictional. Fantastic, fantastic. Okay, um, so I do want to get to some of these questions here. Uh, first question I have is, do you think that the technology in your books drives the story, or does the story drive the technology? This is for both of you guys. The story drives the technology to some extent. Um, and until we get to book three in my book, um, in my series, we don't really get to the, to the really truly futuristic side of things. Um, because um, in my world, in the world that I'm depicting, there have been pandemics, 
there's been climate change, there's been all kinds of things that have impacted the US. And so in many ways, science was put on hold for the middle part of the country, for the homestead territories. Mm. For the eastern superstate and the western superstate, that's a different story. And they are moving forward in some really interesting ways. And I guess one of the conflicts, therefore, that has erupted is, what do the eastern and western superstates that are liberty states how do, they, how do they react to this, what they call this kind of cancer in the center of, this, of uh, the country? Do they try to help the people or do they trade with their homestead territories? And for the most part, they trade. And it really seems to me as though that's exactly what would happen. That uh, if you think about what we're doing now, how many times do we trade with, with countries and other places and not worry about human rights at all? And of course, we say we've got to because there's all kinds of things that we need. And that's the, the kind of reasoning behind the fact that the Eastern and Western superstates do that same thing. But I do think that uh, one of the wonderful things about getting to the Bird Tribe, which is the third book, is that it allows me to think about how social media is being handled, for example, in uh, New England, which is where the book begins in the Berkshires and what kinds of things will be prohibited after the lessons that people have learned about the dangers of social media. And so there's some really interesting things I hope that I'll be exploring in book three when they, come, when they move towards the future and go to the Eastern Superstate. Yeah, in my book, we are pretty much technologically where we are now, and that was very deliberate. Um, an early reader of the book said, I love how the Chippewa have cell phones. And I was like, I'm a Chippewa with a cell phone. Like, <laughs> you know, we, but that was the point. I wanted to show this, it would have developed to that point regardless of colonization. There's a very much a stereotype that Native Americans are less civilized, for lack of a better term. And I wanted to show that's not what would have happened. Absolutely not. It would have arrived at the same space. Um, I'm currently working on the second, uh, finishing up the second book and it takes place in England, in a Europe that never had colonies. And it shows sort of the flip side. In that book, technology is very, treated very differently. It's a much more restrictive society and access to technology is very limited because they're trying to keep um, uh, people in line in a way that just isn't an issue in The Peacekeeper. Um, so I wouldn't say it really drove anything. I just thought, well, I'll, I've decided we, any tool that I have available today technology-wise is also going to be available. But um, for example, you see a lot of traditional medicine used as, as, alongside modern medicine, what we would call modern medicine. Um, I guess that's the only one I sort of consciously put in there, but by and large, it didn't really drive it one way or the other. Awesome. Uh, so this question is for you, Brooke. Um, and kind of touched on this a moment ago there. Um, can you talk about your transition from lawyering to creative writing? Uh, how did you balance uh, that career, shift along with mothering? Uh, all of these lawyers, uh, I'm not getting the rest of this, I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah, so let's, let's start there. Can you talk about your, tra your transition, balancing creative writing with being a lawyer? Just because I did it doesn't mean I know how. <laughs> um, well, I'm still a practicing lawyer, and I still have my kids. Um, <laughs> in fact, I wrote the first draft of The Peacekeeper while I was on maternity leave with my second. Credit to my law firm, truly, for its progressive maternity policies. I had a six-month maternity leave. Um, and I spent three months with a colicky baby who I could never set down, never put to sleep. And I, spent the, I decided you know, I'd spend the next three working on this book that wouldn't leave me alone, this idea. Um, tr I hate the advice, write every day. I think it's the worst advice anyone can give. It comes from a great place, but when you have kids, when you have a job, you can't write every day. It's not realistic. You'll go insane, don't ask me how I know. So <laughs> take a car whatever time you can carve out to do it, do it. Um, you know, I, but you have to make sacrifices. Um, when I was writing, I kind of, I reduced my hours at my job, which came with a commensurate pay cut. It meant I kicked the can down the road a few years for advancement. I did it 
clear-eyed, wanting to, because this was very important to me. Um, you have your second child in your late 30s, you decide, well, I'm not getting any younger, gotta get, make this happen. Um, so, but having a support system is crucial. Um, my law firm knows I write, they're very supportive of it. My family knows. My husband is phenomenal. Um, he takes you know, more than his share of uh, parenting duties, and I couldn't do it without him. Um, he's just been a phenomenal source of support and, um, you know, other people who've watched my kids or who have helped me with work so that I can pursue these things. So you can't do it as an island, and you do have to make some trade-offs. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have done it any differently, um, but it does mean you've sacrificed a lot of sleep, and I also haven't kept up with TV in about six years. That's another <laughs> way to do it, too. So no one spoil like Better Call Saul for me because I'm still on season one. <laughs> Well, how about for you as well, listen, I mean, because you're an educator as well. How do you balance a career and writing these three books? You know, it's, it's so difficult. And um, I, I like to, to teach with, with everything that I've got, I think. I mean, I, I do think I have a vocation for teaching. Um, and that's why I went into it. And uh, it w I think things were going along pretty well but when we had the mass shootings at Virginia Tech, um, I worked very closely with the shooter to try to get help for him before this happened. And uh, uh, unfortunately, because at the time it was 2007 and, and people didn't really want to think about the fact that it was happening. It was rather like what we're going through now, where people could see lots of signs but didn't necessarily want to do things about it. And so I think I'm an, an even more conscientious teacher now. Um, I wrote a book about it called No Right to Remain Silent. And in the book, I tried to talk about what it was like to be a teacher and what it's like to be a student now and how there's a, there's a tremendous pressure being put on teachers who need to be able to diagnose students. And I get calls still all the time from people who are saying, I have students in my class and I'm really worried because I don't know what's going to happen. What should I do? Where should I go? And so I feel as though I still have that very important role to play in terms of talking to teachers. So I'll go around to, to schools and universities and talk about this kind of thing. And uh, so I think it takes up a lot of time. So I find myself uh, writing very, very late at night uh, so maybe till one or two sometimes and then getting up at like six or seven to try to make sure that I can keep up with the teaching and not miss things that I need to, to be aware of. Um, I do want to say to anyone in the audience who, who feels a kind of sense of despair or hopelessness that it really is the most amazing thing to be able to re-find, recapture, rediscover wonder and that we can make ourselves do it. That always, despair is also an idea in many ways. It's an idea we decide to live with or an idea we decide not to. And I really do feel that after those things happened, it put a lot of things in perspective for me. And it made me realize that there are some things that matter greatly and there are some things that really don't matter at all. And that we better start speaking honestly to each other, which we still don't do. Again and again, we don't do it, I think. And I love the fact that uh, one of the reasons why it's so wonderful to be a writer is you can have your characters to say anything they want to each other. <laughs> and I'm kind of shocked by what some of the characters say in these books. <laughs> I say, my goodness, you can't say that. That's <laughs> terrible. And they still say it. And, and what can I do? Because I'm listening. And in many ways, you're a kind of medium, aren't you, when yes. you're a novelist? You're very strange. Not you. But I, I am. Mean, just, no, no, I am. Novelists <laughs> in general are always strange. And you listen to these characters telling you things. And you think, what a world to be in. Those of you who are writers know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. What a thrilling world to live inside where your characters, you've got all these voices in your head. So you go to Kroger and it seems as though you're shopping, but really you're in, in some kind of life and death fight in your head between these two characters. And it's such a wonderful refuge. What a great place to be able to go to, I think. So I feel very lucky that way. All right, so the lesson here is if you have voices in your head, write. <laughs> okay? That's Thank what we you, are. Derek. <laughs> um, so next question I want to get to is, um, 
the concept of flying Africans. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about that? Yeah, flying Africans, and I, I don't want to give anything away. Uh, all I'm going to say is that the main character changes, that her body changes in a profound way that reverberates through the culture. Um, I wanted to write a book. It, you know, Tolkien talked about this when he was writing Lord of the Rings, that he wanted to reclaim British legend. He said, we didn't really have any myths, and we don't. In, in Britain, we had fairies and stuff, so my grandmother would always go out to look for the fairies, never found any. Um, and that they had some elves, a few, you know, uh, these kinds of legends. But the whole idea of myth, the idea that myth is what makes us. Mm. It makes us know who we are. And I think as people of color, and in my family, we can trace our heritage back through to Africa, what that meant, how important it is to understand something about the, I think, the greatest metaphor, what we call a conceit, an elaborate metaphor that guides us is the whole idea of rising up. We will rise. And we will rise literally, and we will rise figuratively. And there is something so amazing about the idea that you can just spontaneously do that. And that was what flying Africans did. When they were on the planting, all of a sudden, they would spontaneously down. Now, that sounded like thunder, didn't it? But I don't think it was. I think it was just a cart. Um, <laughs> they would just spontaneously rise up and fly away from the plantation. And I'd written about that in poetry, but so wonderful to be able to reclaim it in a novel because I feel as though there is no greater metaphor that brings all of us together, black and white. Because isn't religion and isn't the whole notion of salvation all about rising up? And doesn't that make us so similar to each other rather than being so different? And so it's those commonalities that I feel as though we have an ethical responsibility to explore, and flying Africans seem to me to be one of the best ways to do it. That's fantastic, that's awesome. Brooke, is there anything, um, cultural legends, cultural myths, that you bring from the Chippewa trap into your book? We touch on it very, very briefly, but the book is sort of deliberately secular. And I did that because I myself am very secular, but I think that really, instead of a particular myth, it's a perspective and it's a value system. So, you know, again, you see it expressed through the legal system. You see it expressed through the way strangers interact with each other. You see it expressed in the way that, you know, entire cities are built. Um, you have that different value system. You have that, you know, it's built around community. Um, they always say you never feel more isolated or alone than when you're in a city. That's not true in Chicago. Um, you're never, you know, people do experience and feel that isolation, but not in the way that we would, you know, some of us might feel or have experienced ourselves. Um, there's a whole, we do have um, the book, one of the opening scenes in the book is the Manoman Festival, which is a real thing in the late summer, wild rice, Manoman, which is the only indigenous grain to the Americas, is harvested. And they go out in canoes, families do, and they harvest it, and we still do it today, uh, as it has been done. You get together as a community and you dance the rice. And what that means is you get it, it's still in its husks, you dig a little hole, you put you know, modern days we usually use a tarp, but you put something down, someone gets very soft moccasins, they hold on to two logs, and they start twisting their ankles over it and dancing it, and that's how you separate it. Now that's something we would probably do mechanically, probably is how it's done now, but in the Anishinaabe, you dance on it. And I wanted to show where we're dancing on rice. It's shifting, it's um, ever-changing, you have to keep your balance, but to have that be, you know, it's a huge uh, phenomenon in the book where people travel back to their homes, it's the biggest holiday of the year, and what are you doing? You're harvesting some rice. It sounds very small, but to have that be a big source of community, a big source of returning home, um, I wanted that to kind of be the opening and show kind of what, I thought that was a perfect way to encapsulate what, what this culture is about. That's awesome. So we're coming here to the uh, to the end. So I have like the last five questions. What I want, I'm five minutes. <laughs> um, 
What I want to uh, ask each of you is about the takeaways, right? We talked about, well, you ladies talked about um, the personal and bringing that into your stories. What was it for you that you wanted to get out um, from, you know, get out to people through uh, your characters and through your stories, through the voices in your heads? I, I suppose, I suppose for me it was that there is such a kind of multiplicity of voices. There are so many voices. I didn't realize that I had 200 and something characters in book one till the publishers indexed this. <laughs> I thought, who are all these people? <laughs> and it's just, and I wanted it to be a kind of chorus that there are so many different and differing characters who contrast with each other, but yet they find a way to to bridge those differences often. And so there's a character in it called Lucky Dice who is British and uh, very sarcastic. You know the, the way Brits are, terrible. <laughs> and uh, in many ways, I think that uh, I, more than anything else, I think I wanted to say the future that we, we seem to be barreling towards is not inevitable and that there is a way to deviate from it if we listen to each other. And finding ways to do that, active ways to do that, is the most important thing we can do, I think. Um, for me, it's, a, it's something that's not in the book, and it's not in the book very deliberately, but I get asked is, well, how did colonization never happen? What, what was different? And I bet if I were to ask 10 different people in this room, well, how do you think colonization could have been avoided? I'd probably get 10 different answers. That's the point. To think, to, it's kind of choose your own adventure, whatever headcanon you have about how colonization could have been avoided, I think it's correct, I have my theory. Um, but the idea is that it didn't have to be this way. And if 10 different people can come up with 10 different ways that it didn't happen, that shows you how avoidable it probably was. Um, I've said this before, but um, I used to watch this documentary series called Seconds from Disaster. And it was on, I think, Discovery, and it would go over major disasters like the Challenger, the Titanic, things like that. And they talk about how um, it's never just one thing. It's a chain of events that happen. And all of those things have to happen for this disaster. If one of them doesn't happen, that disaster is avoided. And I thought, well, colonization is absolutely no different. There was a whole host of things that all had to happen at the same time so that an entire continent of people you know, we're, we're subject to genocide and we're, we're you know, att there were attempts at erasing them that still in a lot of cases continue. So I guess the big takeaway is, you know, kind of sit with it and think about, well, how do you, you know, how do you think the world might have looked different? Why would it look different? What would have happened differently? At what point would it have been different? And I think that if you want to, for me, it was a, you know, something that took, you know, f I focused on for years, just thinking about all the different ways it could have gone. And I think my, you know, if you're reading the book or if you're not, but you still want to think about this, I think it's a good exercise to see how these great tragedies really can be avoided with a few small differences and a few small changes. Well, this has been incredible. Thank you, ladies. Thank you Please so much, Derek. Lucinda and Brooke, round of applause. Thank you so much. Uh, these young ladies will actually be signing today in the, um, and Hall C lower level uh, from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, we do want to thank you all for attending uh, the Library of Congress National Book Festival. Uh, if you didn't get a chance to attend everything you wanted to see, uh, please you can just go to loc.gov uh, this month um, to watch the events you missed. And uh, we'll see you all next year. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank, thank you. you so much.